Hi everyone, my name is Yi Chen. It's my pleasure today to present Memorizer, a listless instruction to object memory tracing in the Linux kernel. This is a co-work with Nick, Lucas, Peru, Imani, Lili, and Nathan. I'll start with the motivation of this work. Well, Linux is complex because of its huge code base. And we can see the structure right here. It's so complex, and it's very easy for developer to make mistakes because of this. So the problem is, this poor visibility will make the maintenance and development very hard. Like, we want to change the schedule algorithm of the kernel, then what we would do is read the source code, and we see that, okay, we have a scheduler right here. Then we see all the kinetic components right here. But easy that we miss just one component, like this one. So it leads to this bug. Okay, then we smack it. But is there any more? Is there more outside? We don't know. So this probability make the make this maintenance and development so hard, and it's very easy for developer to to make a single mistake and all the system crash. So um, developer they usually use this trial and error development. But can we do better? Like eBPF? Well, the problem of eBPF is because you have to know what you are looking for and it is still a try and error approach. So can we do like a single shot query and get all the answer, answer we want? So in this work, we propose Memorizer. And Memorizer, in Memorizer, we want to open the box of Linux by using this instruction action object model to quantify the Linux kernel behavior. So we can think of the subject as an instruction. And the action is one of these allocate free, read, write, call, and return. And it will have action on this object. So the object here is a memory chunk. So in Memorizer, we want to trace the object allocations, data access, and function calls. And the design of Memorizer is we want a complete trace of every kernel object allocated. And we want the data to be meaningful, meaning that you have to represent uh, the kernel, kernel information. And because our data has this huge size, so we need the output to be loseless. And finally, we want the system to be maintainable, meaning we want minimum impact to the system. Okay, so now we have the motivation. I'd like to go on to the design of Memorizer. First is this Memorizer design architecture. We won't look at, we won't go through every detail of this graph, but we will pick up a few important design here. We like to pick up the, uh, how we instrument the, the Linux kernel and how we store the, the metadata information. And finally is how we manage the memory of Memorizer. So the first and foremost important is how we do the source code level and compile time instrumentation. Well, the first we want to instrument is the allocators because we want the full coverage of memory. So we have to trace the global region, the heap region, and the stack region. Then we have to know who has access to this reg region. And our work is based on Kazan, because Kazan already instrumented the, the kernel with every load and store. And finally, we also want to instrument the call and return. So we leverage the GCC compile option, F instrument function. Okay. So the most difficult part of this implementation is how do we identify all the memory allocator? Well, we show in this table, we have to identify two regions. The first region is the dynamic region, and the second region is the static region. And in the, in the dynamic region, we have to trace every heap allocator interface, like the page allocator, slave allocator, vmalloc, memblock. And for the static region, we leverage the uh, call and return instrumentation so we can calculate the stack frame size on the fly. And for the stack re static region, we trace the globals and a few uh, fixed range virtual address. Okay, so now we have the, we know the kernel object. Then we also need to know uh, who is accessing this kernel object. And we need to store this metadata information about this kernel object. So we create this uh, we call it shadow object. So what a shadow object is, it's a map to the memory region, and it has this kind of information, like the allocation site, 
the size and the time, so on and so forth. And we need to we need a lookup table to uh, point. Okay, where does this virtual address point to? Point to about this shadow object. So it is a one-to-one -one mapping of the entire kernel virtual address, and each virtual address point to a shadow object. Also, because uh, if you remember, memorize in memorizer, we are tracing the locator interface, so it's easily to mess up with the kernel, the kernel interface we are tracing. So we have to isolate the memory region so that we are not messing up with the kernel allocator. So what we allocate this isolated memory region, and we use it to store the shadow object and look at table. And we, we design this uh, memory region to be uh, per CPU because what we don't want the entrance, uh, sorry, we don't want concurrency or uh, data issues happens when we are running in multi-core environment. Okay, so the design might, might, might sound like it's simple, but it is really not as easy, as easy as we thought. We faced some challenges during the implementation, like the SMP concurrency issue, because we have objects that, 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 is, that are shared among different cores. So we will see like um, rest condition of their lock. And the solution to that is we put a rewrite lock to the shared object, or we make the resource per CPU. And another interesting uh, challenge we face is the re-entrance issue. So you can see from this, this graph right on the right, Memorizer SS actually has some allocate uh, SS and function call inside Memorizer. But Memorizer also want to trace allocate call and SS. So we will enter this infinite loop if we, we are not carefully dealing with this kind of situation. So we have to put a monitor every time before, before we enter the memorizer to make sure we are not uh, going into this infinite loop. Now we have the uh, design of memorizer. I have to talk about the performance of memorizer. So we have to make a good trade-off between how detailed information we want it and how slow the system performance would be because we know that the more detail, the performance will be definitely be slower. So let's look at the ARM bed right here. Kazan brings about two times overhead compared to the Valina Linux, and Memorizer brings about 200 over 200 time overhead. And we know that ARM bench shows the worst case of Memorizer because most of the execution time is spent in the kernel. So how does Memorizer works in the real world use case? Well, we can see from this table. And the worst case is compressed 7 zip test read. Memorizer brings about 4 times overhead to the Linux and 8 times overhead for when we enable the state trace. Well, we expect the state trace to be especially slow because for every function call and return, we have to update the lookup table and the metadata information, which will definitely slow down. So we know that we are trading the uh, system performance for this variable data. So where can we use this variable data for? Well, we bring up three use cases here. The first use case is how we help our XMP paper developer save their development time by uh, automatically query the uh, SS location to the StrawCred. Well, in XMP, they want to protect uh, this StrawCred with a protection mechanism. So they have to identify OSS to do it. Uh, looking at our memorizer data, we found that we already has those information. So we can just single shot query our data and find 31 out of 35 access locations. And the four misses is because of different kernel configuration. XMP, they use uh, SE Linux, and memorizer, we use AppArmor. And the second use case is how we use Memorizer to implement itself. The story is, in our early implementation, we didn't trace all allocator interface properly. So we are seeing things like the UFO, the unidentified foreign object. So we use this UFO notion to help us find the missing allocator interfaces with the uh, label of concerns. Concerns help us uh, find where this SS is coming from? Is this coming from heap 
stake or global region. And we can use the same mechanism to find a new interface if there is more new allocator interface introduced to the kernel. And the last use case I want to bring up here is how we use Minimizer to improve the coverage metric. Well, we know that there are a tons of ways to measure the coverage, like the align coverage, code coverage, branch coverage, so on and so forth. Here, we bring up a, a unique way to, asset, to measure the coverage by using the, a unique SSH. So you can think of uh, the entire Linux test suite as 100% coverage. And each test case in the Linux test suite covers only a portion of it. Then with a limited amount of time, we can set, uh, we can choose the most efficient test case from, uh, from seeing the, uh, the unique SSH here. So we know that uh, with a limit time, which test case to run, like the FS test case here. And the most valuable of how we improve the coverage metric is we can increase the test case coverage by adding the missing edges. With this, I'd like to summarize the takeaway slide. So the takeaway is we build a memory access monitor inside the Linux kernel. And putting this monitor inside the Linux kernel is hard because we are seeing issues like reentrance, concurrency, complexity between different subsystems like the memory system. Also, the design choice of making an object metadata compact and meaningful is not easy. With this, I'd like to conclude our work as we add an essential software engineer capability to the overly complex Linux kernel. With this slide, I'd like to thank you all for listening and open to tech questions. Uh, hi, uh, Eugene. Thanks a lot for the talk, and it's a great work, and I think it's a really timely work also. Uh, and it's quite complex to kind of like look through all the kernel objects inside the OS. Uh, I'll quickly see if there are some questions. Okay, uh, as questions stream through, uh, I'll start with one. Uh, so uh, the Linux kernel memory allocator, there are at least like five or six or seven different interfaces, even with the slab allocator that is exposed to different subsystems. And uh, most of the subsystems, for example, say the network uh, uh, socket buffers, right? They also implement their own uh, allocator above the Linux allocator to frequently cache some of the kernel objects so that they don't have to like frequently allocate the objects again and again and again through the regular slab allocator. So uh, I'm curious when you define or when you identify the lifetime of these kernel objects, like uh, or what is the metric that you use? Like some objects are like repeatedly cached and reused versus some objects are like allocated and freed continuously. So I'm curious, like how do you identify those objects? So the question yeah. is, uh, how do we... Go ahead, Bruce. Anything you want to. Yeah, so the question is, uh, how do we identify like um, all the kernel object, like some are catch, uh, some are some are catch object, and some are just uh, you just uh, allocate an object. So you, you what? So the question is, how do we uh, identify all all these object? Yeah, that's correct. For example, like if I send the data through socket buffer, uh, you allocate the socket buffer, and then you kind of like send the data. But some of the if there is already some buffers that are uh, objects that are already cached, you just use that cached object. So I'm curious, like how do you define lifetime for them? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So the first thing is uh, we identify all the object by like by the Kazan SS because you know that when you SS an object, then uh, if if we didn't have a label, then that means we didn't check 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 those check that object. So yeah, that's how we identify all the kernel object. And as for the uh, cage and not cage object, it's really like a little bit tricky. Like uh, uh like for the for the cage object because we already uh, there's already a pool for, for this catch object, right? So um, so we uh, we actually have to look at the um, catch allocator interface and just cook from there. Um, I'm not sure if that yeah, makes no. sense. I'll add on a little bit. So I, I think um, we didn't 
so and, and Bruce didn't implement this. So this is a very hairy part of the, the, the system. So um, the answer is we don't deal with that. And um, we didn't really, so basically you see where all of these allocations come out, but if I understand right, you're saying that they're just reusing objects. They're not even building a, tr a normal slab interface. I think we could implement a simple analysis pass in the post, post analysis to actually do lifetime and see if we can find patterns. We didn't deal with that, but I, I, I suspect that there's a certain pattern like an initialization routine or something like that. I, you might even know better than us because we don't, know anything about the SK buff interface. So. Sure. so there are a couple of other questions. Uh, the next question is from Joel Nader. Uh, would you be interested in like asking directly through Zoom or if not, I can just, I've given yeah. Joel a good well, permission for you to talk. You can hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, the question is just about the security implications. Uh, it looks like you're adding a lot of detailed information about kernel objects that may be um, helpful to uh, kernel exploits. So I was wondering if you looked at any, any uh, security implications. Yeah, uh, I'll just try to answer the question. Yeah, so the question is, um, do we see like any, do we can, can we use Memorizer to like help like find an attack or prevent an attack like the kernel exploit? So yeah, that's that's something in our in our future work because yeah, we have this notion of of kernel object. Then we can look at yeah, like if there's an mm, um, uh, there's an like an access that is not supposed to happen, and we can observe that in the wrong time, like because we memorize it's just a dynamic tracing tool. So if you run the like you run a uh, security exploit, the memorizer can observe if, if let's say uh, we want to. Um, um, so we want to look at the structure structure and see if there is any unwanted access to that. Then I think what Memorizer can do is we can check if there is any malicious access. Yeah, but we didn't do any actual actual work on the security exploit things. But I think that that, that is something we want to do in the future work. Thanks. Uh, so there is time for one more question, and that's from Antonio. Uh, tracking uh, uh, in memorizer, tracking requires memory. So how do you cap the memory usage for tracking? Are you frequently flushing the trace in some way to disk or can you create filters for the traces? For example, say eBPF, for example. Yes. So the, I think there are uh, two parts of the question. The first question is uh, flushing the trace memory in some way to disk. Yeah, so the first, first question is, um, like how do we output the uh, memorizer data? So all the memorizer data is stored uh, at runtime memory. So we uh, we create a debug FS interface to the user space. So us users at user space, user can uh, output a yes output a, a memorizer data to the disk just once. So but you can think of that yeah because we store all the uh, memorizer data in memory. So a memorizer actually requires. Uh, tons of memory. So if you want to run like a Linux test suite, then we suggest that um, maybe you can allocate a memory like uh, 64 or uh, 96 gigabytes to the memory and you, you can dump all the uh, memorizer data to the disk at once. And the second question is, can you create filter for, for the tracing using eBPF, for example? Well, um, I'm not sure about eBPF, but yes, we can. We can easily like create some like whitelist or blacklist filter. Like if you are only interested in some, let's say uh, function tracing, like you are implement uh, a network subsystem and you are only interested in the network network things, then you can cre create a blacklist or whitelist. But for now we didn't implement the, the filter things yet, but yeah, we can easily add on that. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's that. Yeah, thank you.